G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy once again. Uh, the third video since returning from Europe. I had every intention of doing videos, um, maybe not throughout the week, but at least a predictions video for last week's, or this weekend's semi-finals rather. And uh, as it turned out, I had my cheeks clapped by Lady Jetlag. It's, uh, it's been bizarre, I've been getting home from work at like three and then falling asleep till 11 p.m. and then waking up and going, rats. So. I think I'm back to normal now, and uh, I'm gonna start with a video today talking about some of the uh, trade rumors going on right now, all the stuff that's relevant, because uh, we are approaching that time of the year. It's gonna come quickly. Uh, the thing is the week after grand final day, uh, everything kicks off. So as you can imagine, like 14 teams, or after tonight, 14 teams will have their seasons ended, and thus the off-season stuff really picks up. We are gonna do some content around the final series. I, I know I've been lacking in that area so far, but tomorrow doing a podcast with Busher, talk about the uh, the weekend that was, uh, depending on how Collingwood and Frio goes tonight. We're gonna to preview, uh, of course, the prelim finals uh, next weekend, and then um, perhaps a bit of Brownlow medal talk as well, which I think will be the Sunday now, following the prelim finals. So it's all coming thick and fast at the moment. But today, I'm gonna to talk about some trade rumors. Thank you, first of all, for all the support lately um, about getting back onto the bandwagon uh, of you know making videos again. Some of the comments have been really nice, so I appreciate it. On that note though, it still says that 40% of the people who have watched my videos in the last week uh, are not subscribed to the channel. So if you could jump on the bandwagon and hit subscribe, that would be much appreciated. Sorry to turn that thank you into a plea for subscribers, but I do genuinely appreciate all of you. And of course, before we get into the video, still sponsored by manscaped.com where you can get all your male grooming needs. This particular product is ball wipes, which have come in handy, uh, especially sitting here in this dark, <laughs> dark? Especially sitting here in this uh, pretty warm bedroom uh, recording videos for you all. So that's quite an image I've given you, but you can get 20% off and free shipping on their great male grooming products. You just have to use the code TRUEFORTY20 at checkout. So we'll start off with some of the stories that are more or less confirmed in the media lately. And this one is a pretty big one. I'm referring to Taranto from GWS and Jacob Hopper, both requesting trades from GWS to the Richmond Footy Club this off season. Neither of them are free agents, they're pre-agents pre as it were, not pre-Asian, which means that a trade has to be facilitated for both of these players. Uh, neither of them can just join through free agents. Agency. So we're looking at Richmond stumping up a pretty hefty price for both of these pretty good footballers, you'd have to say. Definitely best 22 players at GWS and uh, will slot straight into Richmond's starting midfield mix, you'd think. Unfortunately, you, you can't help but notice again, it's just another sort of bottoming out weakened team in GWS losing, you know, not maybe not elite, depending on your opinion of them, but close to elite established players to an established Victorian side. I don't even mean to make it a Victorian issue, but more so just the fact that the bottom clubs are getting a little bit weaker and the uh, the top teams are pillaging them for players. It's not something you love to see, uh, but unfortunately that is the reality of our game. From the GWS side of things, this is a massive blow. I feel like pretty much every off season since I've been making videos, have made some sort of point regarding the exodus that they've experienced. I think at the end of 2020 was their, their worst. Uh, but this year again, to lose Taranto and Hopper, both players in the middle of their prime, despite where they finished, I know that you could argue that they're rebuilding. It's the instability that worries me. And for me, I'm worried about where GWS is gonna be next year without these players, let alone, you know, in five years time, I feel very, very concerned about the future of that footy club if they can't stabilize and keep some players because they could become another Gold Coast Suns. They've managed to stay afloat, you know, and been competitive for a good number of years now, but that's not gonna last forever. And they, they sort of always had this balance of they're still playing well and they were able to sort of fork out the players that they didn't necessarily need. And they were able generally to retain the players they did wanna keep, but now that balance is shifting. They're not winning games. They're bleeding, they're bleeding players. I'm genuinely worried in their ability to bounce back up the ladder. I think it could be a really troubling sign for the Giants, but talking about Richmond for a second, I think this is a huge recruitment for them. I think it shows a lot about where their mindset is as a list, and maybe it's not surprising. They've just uh, made the finals, admittedly got knocked out in week one, but you know, at the end of 2021, they missed the finals. There was talk about, is this Richmond era over? Now, 12 months on, it's looking quite the opposite. They've recruited potentially two uh, close to elite footballers in their midfield, and that was kind of a weak area of their side, I would have to say. 12 months ago, they looked at Chera, uh, failed to get him in, and uh, this year, 
potentially Taranto and Hoppo. It just it boggles the mind. Further to that, Cochran re-signs for another year, I think, and Dusty, um, obviously they've got a bit of money because I think his massive contract's ended. They're going to renegotiate him on lower salary, you'd imagine. But with him playing on, Cochran playing on, Taranto and Hopper into that side, they're a side that is gearing up for another Premiership assault. How close they can get to it, I am... Um, that's too early to say, isn't it? But with Richmond's quality, you have to give him a bloody good chance of getting close again next year, which is... It's, a, it's annoying, isn't it? Probably extra annoying for me as an Eagles fan, as a team that sort of wedged up and won a flag in the middle of that Richmond dynasty, for us to have fallen on, fallen on our asses completely and Richmond potentially gearing up for another Premiership assault. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not a great feeling, but anyway. But in terms of what it's going to cost the Tigers, uh, you'd imagine massive amount of draft capital. So they currently hold 12, 19, and 30 in this year's draft. And uh, I'd imagine all of those picks will make their way to GWS and potentially a future first as well, because you're looking at two players that I think generally the sort of expectation or the standard for two or at least a very good player in their prime is two first rounders, right? Whether they be early or late, depending on how good the player is. So if you unpack it as, you know, 19 in a future first for Taranto and 12 and 30 for Hopper, I think that kind of equals out. So Richmond potentially blowing, you know, two years of draft picks to recruit these players, not criticizing it. It's just, it's going to cost them heavily. And from a GWS perspective, you know, great, they got more draft picks, but as I said, I'm a little bit concerned about them long term. It doesn't stop there for the Giants either, unfortunately. It looks like Tanner Brun, you know, a first round draft pick from, I think it was the 2020 draft, only a couple of years ago, uh, reportedly was out and he's been linked to both Geelong and North Melbourne. And that's a really bad result. You know, as I said, all these draft picks are great in theory, but if you keep losing players after two years, in a fairly promising player in Tanner Brun, I would say, not a great result. That, to my eyes, is probably the biggest story uh, on the trade docket so far, so to speak. But we'll move through some of the other stories. I think Carl Amon is close to the most official move so far. I think he's nominated Hawthorne through free agency. So there's not too much you know, negotiating to happen. I think uh, it's, it's just a case of working out what that compensation is going to be and, uh, and Hawthorne. Uh, formally accepting it. Maybe Port Adelaide have to decide whether they're going to match the bid, but either way, I think Carl Lehman most likely gets to the Hawks this off-season. Interesting strategic move from the Hawks. Obviously, we kind of associate them as being a side that's you know, towards the bottom of the ladder, investing in youth. So to pull the trigger on a 27-year-old in Carl Amon, they clearly think maybe that they're a bit more progressed than perhaps other people view their list. So to me, that suggests, you know, finals is the goal next year with Sam Mitchell. So Port Adelaide lose a uh, established wingman who on his day is a very, very good wingman. Um, one of the few, you know, specialist wingmans in the competition. To their credit though, they are well and truly in the mix to have a big trade period themselves. Obviously, they've been linked to uh, Junior Rioli. I did talk about this in my Eagles related a video around how I feel about that potential move and, and to sum it up basically I, I kind of suggested that I support Rioli's decision it's his last contract probably ever so if he's chasing dollars I get it if you want to see my expanded thoughts you can watch that video but from a poor Adelaide perspective I think this is potentially a really good move and I am a massive Rioli fan and I've seen him tear teams up and even as recently as this year towards the end of the year I think he came back from injury a little bit underdone but you have to go back and watch some of his performances in the first month of the season to see this guy can win games and Port Adelaide clearly are uh, aiming to not only finish in the finals next year but potentially contend from a flag contend for a flag for them Rioli turns 28 next year he's probably got a good few years left uh, joined the AFL late missed out two years so potentially some longevity particularly if you're looking at a four-year contract for him as well but I think Understandably, Port fans might have a little bit of trepidation about you know what it's going to cost for Rioli, but I honestly think by middle of the next year, you'll love him and you'll think you've got a bargain. What does it cost them? Yeah, this one's a tricky one because I understand both sides of the argument. Port fans will argue that he's just missed out two years, didn't have a crash hot this year, shouldn't be worth much. Conversely though, you know, he's still a bloody good player. And the fact that they're offering a four year deal suggests that they rate him as such. So I think best case scenario for us as an Eagles fan, we're hoping for whatever the Carl Amon compensation is, potentially a pick in the mid twenties. I think that would be a good result for us. And like I said, Port fans might not seem like it now, but I reckon middle of next year, you'll think that was a bargain. Another one of the uh, bigger names to potentially be moving this off season is Josh Dunkley, obviously linked to a move to Essendon at the end of 2020. And uh, that deal didn't get through. So he stuck out the rest of his contract, but uh, it appears, you know, he's currently unsigned 
and the noise is he's on his way out of the club. I don't really know too much about this situation, to be honest, other than the two clubs linked to him are Brisbane and Port Adelaide. So again, we talked about Port Adelaide gearing up for uh, a way back into that top eight or potentially top four, you'd imagine, and uh, obviously trying to bolster that midfield. And similarly, Brisbane, um, they just won last night and are into a prelim, so they're obviously equally thinking about premierships and flags. So those are the two non-Victorian clubs that seem to be in the mix for Josh Dunkley. What does he cost? Well, Port Adelaide have pick eight. I think that's probably about right, to be honest, to, in terms of simplicity. I don't know if there's going to be a shuffle of picks, but I think, you know, a first round pick um, is about right. They may get something back. For Brisbane, I think the potential move gets a little bit messier. Obviously, they've got two uh, father-sons in this year's draft, Jasper Fletcher and Will Ashcroft, who is going to cost a lot of draft capital themselves. So unless they're willing to trade future picks, uh, and whether the Bulldogs are able to accept that. I find it harder to imagine a Brisbane deal getting done here, but let, let me know in the comments, am, am I missing something here? Is there other clubs linked to him? Uh, as far as I can see, it's only Brisbane and Port Adelaide, but uh, I think there's a bit of water to go under the bridge in terms of this situation. Then you've got the Luke Jackson trade scenario, which has been talked about all year. Uh, he's been linked to Fremantle heavily, West Coast supposedly in the race, but I think it's kind of a case of us just being there to make things a little bit annoying for Fremantle. I think he's pretty much gone to Fremantle. I believe that uh, Goodwin said in a press conference that Jackson would make his decision, decision over the next couple of days. To me, that's the writing on the wall. That means uh, wait for his announcement that he's requesting a trade personally. So we talked a little bit about it on the channel. Obviously, it makes sense for pretty much any club in the competition to be looking and be interested in a Luke Jackson. Uh, he ticks both boxes of being, you know, able to contribute to a team in contention. Obviously, he's a premiership player now. He's only 21 or something like that. Uh, but obviously, he's got the longevity of being a potential 10 to 12 year player in the competition. So from a Fremantle perspective, you can understand the interest. My concern, and I know this is something Busher raised earlier on the on the channel earlier this season, is the potential fallout of chasing uh, a big player like that on huge dollars. So specifically, I'm referring to some of those mid-tier players, those fringe players at Fremantle who may leave as a result. And this may or may not be related to Jackson. It may be related to their own lack of opportunity. But suddenly, when you're paying a million dollars a year to Luke Jackson, the ability to match an offer for a Blake Akers becomes far harder, doesn't it? So some of the players linked to moves away from Fremantle will be a Blake Hagers, as I suggested, a player who's had a great season. I think Carlton seems to be linked to him, uh, which would be a strange move for him to move to WA for a couple of years and then back, but we've seen crazier things before. Darcy Tucker and Griffin Logue potentially to North Melbourne. Tucker's that classic midfield fringe player who understandably probably isn't going to get a look in with some of their draft picks in recent years. Griffin Logue, you know, is virtually best 22 every week, if I'm not mistaken, but seems to be getting a fair bit of interest from rival clubs and potentially more opportunity in his desired position, which I think is a, as a lockdown defender. I could be wrong on that. Then there's Lloyd Meek, who potentially keeps his spot on the list if they don't recruit Jackson, uh, has been linked to the GWS Giants or uh, Melbourne or even loosely West Coast. I don't know how real that is. And then Rory Lobb as well to the Western Bulldogs. Again, another move that may happen regardless of Jackson because Lobb has been linked to moves away. But either way, you're looking at a fairly reasonable exodus there from Fremantle in terms of their mid-tier and their depth. Let me know in the comments what you think about that, particularly if you're a Fremantle fan, losing all those players in one hit. Is it going to hurt? Um, personally, I, I look at the players Fremantle have drafted in recent years. You've Erasmus, Johnson, O'Driscoll, to name a few, who haven't really got a game yet. Sam Sturt as well has been injury plagued. And there's probably enough coming up there to, to cover those gaps. But in terms of getting the deal done, Fremantle currently have uh, what pick in the mid-teens at the moment, potentially get pick 12 or whatever lob. So a couple of first rounders, maybe you know one of those picks in a future first, not too sure, goes to Melbourne. I don't know how much more Melbourne can realistically ask for if he's out of contract. That may be what it takes to get the deal done. And then the flow on from that is also that Brody Grundy may be making his way from Collingwood, another player who was signed on massive dollars on a seven-year deal, if I'm not mistaken. Mistaken, and uh, Collingwood kind of looking to offload him because he's not really offering as much as that contract would suggest. And Melbourne have emerged as the prime candidate, and this is again a flow on from potentially losing Luke Jackson as well. So we may have a situation next year where Gorn and Grundy, the two players like famously compared to around that 17 to 19 period, may be playing in the same ruck division, uh, which is massive. Obviously, Grundy's dropped off a little bit, but if there's a chance that he recaptures his form and plays alongside Gorn, it'll be interesting to watch at the very least. Looking at North Melbourne for a moment, obviously a new coach under Alistair Clarkson, and uh, it's been interesting to see, obviously, the assessments he's made of their list as, you know, 
one of the best coaches of the modern era, if, if not the best. He's come in and joined one of the weakest teams of the modern era, you'd have to say, in North Melbourne. And uh, obviously, in terms of looking at how the media has reported who they're targeting, it's clear that he's looked at it least and thought, we need some more established players, which is interesting for a side that's bottoming out. Um, and they hold pick one in this year's draft, admittedly. But some of the players are linked to are Tucker and Loeg, like I suggested. Apparently in the hunt for Rioli, I don't know how close they are to actually getting him. Tanner Braun is a player I touched on before, and Ben Long as well from the Saints. So clearly looking to plug that gap in their sort of middle demographic of their list. You will recall a few years ago, North Melbourne cut a number of experienced players, and you know, time will tell if that was the right move. But it's interesting that Clarkson's looking at the list now and thinking, geez, we could use some 25 year olds. And it won't come at the expense of drafting youth as well. You know, they've been drafting heavy for a number of years. Hold last year's number one pick and Jason Horn Francis currently on their list and will go into this year's draft with pick one if they don't trade it as well. So it's not at the expense of drafting in kids, but it'll be interesting to see what moves Clarkson can pull off to bridge that gap in their list and what immediate impact it will have on them next year because it could bump them up from you know probably as it sits they're the wooden spoon favorite for next year it could bump them out of the top, bottom four rather so that'll be interesting and finally this story broke uh, while I was away and it's not the biggest surprise but Isaac Rankin from the Gold Coast Suns the mercurial small to medium forward has requested a trade back to Adelaide again this is not a big shock he's been talked about as a potential move for a number of years pretty much since he's been drafted there was talk it might be to a Victorian club but he's chosen to go home to the Adelaide Crows and this is uh, a big plus for the Adelaide Crows for where they're at as a list to recruit, you know, a guy who's had a few years of development in him. They must be looking at a potential combination of Rochelle and Rankin in that forward line and thinking, gee whiz. They can sure probably use, I think, in my opinion, keep drafting for that elite midfielder to take him to the next level. But a couple of match winners in that forward line for sure. And obviously, again, same theme as we talk about with the Suns each year. It's, it's a bad loss to, to lose a player of that quality. If they can snag Adelaide's pick five or whatever it is currently, then they go into the draft with a really good position. They're probably looking at offloading some second rounders. They've got second rounders coming out of their wazoo this season. So I foresee Gold Coast being aggressive and trying to trade their second rounders this year into next year. So that will open up some opportunities for the rest of our clubs uh, to potentially trade into this year's draft as well. So keep an eye out for that. The reason being, as far as I'm aware with the Suns, they just don't have the list spots to take as many picks as they do. And uh, I think looking at next year's draft as well looks really strong. So in a sense, they're in a good position there, but I'm sure they prefer to keep a player like Isaac Rankin, just for stability as much as anything. Anyway, guys, that's sort of my take on uh, all the current trade news. I've probably missed something out there that was really obvious. So I apologize if I've done that, but there is so much going on this season that it is very, very difficult to organize my thoughts into a video. So we will be making trade content as it happens over the course of the next month or so. So let me know in the comments what you think about what's going on. And uh, yeah, like I said, let me know if there's anything obvious I missed. But stay tuned for more content, guys. I appreciate you sticking fat and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.